And then we always hope to hear everyone's voice in a large group at least once. So, um, all right. So here we are, and we have someone at the 808. Who's in the 808 area code? That's, Sam that's Samuel. Oh, Samuel Sarpia. Uh, yes. Joining the, okay. This is the Beyond the Dream cohort meeting today. It's not oh, the Nonviolence Coordinated co Committee meeting. I think, I, I think I have my meetings mixed up, so I will okay. sign off. And <laughs> <laughs> it's good to hear your voice, though, Samuel. But it's good to hear your voice. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long time. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a long time. You see why I have my meetings mixed up? I'm sorry for crushing your meetings. <laughs> All right, peace, brother. Okay, talk to you soon. Bye bye. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Okay, so be thinking about whether you're ready to step up for an nonviolence pep talk, and we're going to go into our check in, which is a one word lightning go round about the energy that you're bringing to the call today. We're going to go around the circle. Um, we'll start from 12 o'clock, if that were a clock, and we'll go around, and if you're here, go ahead and say your name, and anybody who hasn't put themselves on the circle will catch you at the end. So, um, let's see, it looks like that would be Chris to start us off. Mm -hmm. One word, what's the energy you're bringing to the call? Oh, you're muted. Excited. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Uh, and not here yet. Jen, then Sonia. Refreshed. Oh. That's good. And Sonia? I mute my Oops. <laughs> I'm trying to think of another word other than exhausted that sounds more positive. But, uh. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I'm authentically exhausted, but intrigued and interested. Excellent. Uh, and I guess that takes us to David, and then it'll be Mary Lou. Long term. Long term. All right. Mary Lou? Uh, pleased. Pleased. Um, next would be, I don't think Barb's here yet. Okay. We're going around the circle in, this, in our slide. So the next would be Radia and then me. Yeah, so I'm I'm exhausted. That's my word. Okay, so you have an exhausted subgroup. All right. Um, my feeling is tender after one word. Tender. <laughs> um, next would be Sarah, but she's not here yet. Um, then it will be Marie, and then we'll catch anyone who hasn't put themselves in the circle. Chaotic. Okay. And then I think that we have Joan May and then Gail, who we haven't heard from yet. Okay, refreshed? Refreshed? Oh, yeah, too refreshed. Uh, right. Rushed? Oh, rushed. Uh, <laughs> And and Gail? My tech wasn't working. <laughs> I feel prepared. Okay, all right. So we reach the moment where uh, it's time for an Alvarez pep talk. Who wants to uh, practice those leadership skills and uh, give us something for a minute or two that will fire us up this morning? This afternoon. I can, I guess. Thanks, Jennifer. You're welcome. So here's my two minutes. Um, this last Sunday, I got to march in the Peace Heroes Walk in Dayton, um, which is which was really cool. A whole bunch of people from all over Dayton got together in on a river at a river skate park, and honored all of the people who have made a difference nonviolently in our in our world and in our community. So people from um, Dayton local heroes were nominated, um, and there was, here to give you an idea of how many peace heroes there were in Dayton, this whole stack of cards is each a different person. 
Um, and that was so encouraging to me to see all these different people that have made such a big difference in Dayton and across, across our world. Um, I think Martin Luther King Jr. is in here somewhere. I know um, Ted Studebaker is, who was a, um, a Church of the Brethren member who went into the Vietnam War as a conscientious objector and worked as a farmer and ended up losing his life um, trying to farm and build something up in Vietnam instead of tearing it down. Uh, so that was just, for me, that was really encouraging. We all walked to the Dayton Peace Museum in like this huge mass um, and kind of overwhelmed this tiny little building. Um, and there was good energy in the air and I got to walk beside some of Ted Studebaker's family. And that was cool to kind of hear about him as a brother and as a cousin. Um, so yeah, so there are people out there who care about this stuff and they're doing it and they're doing it well. Thanks, Jen. Thanks for stepping up. All right. Um, so, Radia is going to put us into randomized pairs. The attendance is um, enough off from the whole group that we're not going to try and put people specifically with the buddies that we'd um, set you up with. So, um, and these are three minutes, and the question is, um, basically what stands out to you from these readings in light of your own work if you want to also um or instead just connect about the word that you brought today that's fine too so radio will you put us in random pairs and um bring us back after three minutes Okay, welcome back, everybody. We are headed into um, some context from Joan May related to women's experiences, which will be about five minutes. And then we move into key and nonviolence connections, connections to the framework and the approach from these readings from David. So, Joan May, are you ready to go? Yes. Okay, and I'm not muted. Good. So this kind of continues from the previous discussion. Um, last time I opened with thinking of the systems of patriarchy as one of the lenses, and this time um, the, what stood out in some of the readings uh, were a couple of things. One is so clearly that hearing women's perspectives expands what we know about what was happening in the movement in terms of the ways um, women supported not only the men and the families, but the specific roles they had, for, like Dorothy Cotton working with Jim Bevel to do specific nonviolence training. Um, and I also was struck by how I thought of some, the women doing their own work even before uh, they started working with um, Dr. King. So, for example, Coretta was, and I'll say a little bit more about her background, um, the whole book I would highly recommend. Um, she worked for World Peace even while she was in college, even before she met Dr. King. And by the time we um, read this chapter, she had already survived the family had already survived bombings because uh they had already done the montgomery bus boycott and she was aware then that as she describes it as thrust into the movement that was so much larger than 
uh, she would have imagined. So she knew that there was a special role. And I was struck too by the, the way she had to, and like other women, interpret the movement to children. Um, I was struck by how she had to interpret Dr. King's legacy to the very, very young children. And like other mothers, she had to introduce them to racism and discrimination. Um, and she even pointed out some of the standards of beauty and talked about why then freedom was so important now. And that seemed to the Freedom Now piece seemed to resonate with Dr. King's, of course, um, why we can't wait. So we wouldn't get these perspectives on expanding the movement if, if we hadn't uh, read about the women. And also Dorothy Cotton points out um, this challenge of historiography with uh, Andrew Young representing her role quite differently. So I think it's important to look at these, these different um, perspectives. So, and, and most people know D Diane Nash was uh, married to James Bevel, and some accounts say that it was her idea to do a lot of that work at Birmingham. Um, so, uh, there's more that will continue in the next piece. Thanks. Okay. Um, are there any questions or comments or um, responding to what Joe May has brought? We just have a couple minutes for that specifically. I had a question. Um, oh, I guess I have to raise my hand. No, you're good. Who's? Oh, okay. Um, so one thing that's not really spoken in any of, of these pieces about women is the, is the fact that this movement, or at least the, the more troubling part for women who wanted to really express them, themselves in their own voice is that this is clergy-led, you know, and that at the time right. there were no women clergy. And in fact, it seemed like it was almost difficult for anyone secular to have a leadership role. And I, I just wondered, is that, you know, just any comment about that? Um, actually, I don't know if I mentioned, I mentioned this to a couple of people, but I was at the SNCC anniversary workshop where, that was on the role of clergy in the movement. And it was all men on the panel. And by this, huh. by um, 2010, um, women had already been ordained. And they really spoke up and said, we carried the movement and we should have been represented here, uh, you know, 50 years later. Um, and I think, and they, that's, they were beginning to, um, they hadn't yet published Hands on the Freedom Plow, but that was one of the major motivations for that to get their th their voices out there and um, there also were a lot of um, there are a lot of reflections on how in the march in Washington afterwards there was a, a like a reception at the White House for the leaders and the women weren't invited um, I don't even think Coretta went Coretta didn't go to that um, it was all Dorothy these Hay Dorothy Hay those Hay leaders did, did David is David yeah, I was just going to say, Dorothy, from the uh, uh, National Council of Negro Women, pushed her way into the meeting on those very terms. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but, but they weren't on, like, the guest yeah, list. Yeah, they didn't invite her. <laughs> <She> just... <laughs> and they had to advocate for somebody on the, on the podium um, at the march. Right. So... The times. So. But in the words of the women that I heard, we carried the movement. <laughs> so. Yeah, I was so appreciative for the for meeting these pieces this month because it really 
demonstrated that like in a way that Dr. King's writings is, it made me think about top down or bottom up from the Kingian perspective that like his writings, care. even though they're about the ins and outs of the campaign, this is really like the actual nitty gritty of what happened and what it took to make it happen. Uh, so. mm -hmm. All right, well, let's move to uh, David. Um, and David, the section is about making connections to the King and Nonviolence approach specifically for this month's reading. Well, uh, Why We Can't Wait, I think, is one of the great books in King's series of five books. Um, in a way, it bookends the movement uh, in the emergence of, of nonviolence in the context of a case study of race in America. And that it's a great partner with a book we'll cover in the second phase of the Beyond the Dream seminar, which is uh, Richard Gregg's The Power of Nonviolence, which was more focused on Gandhi's experiences and more international things, whereas Martin Luther King set it in the context of race in America. And it was a wonderful case study from that standpoint. I think there are three or four things that stand out here. Uh, one is, it opens with how nonviolence evolved leading up to 1963 and how uh, it had to go through many, many series of experiments. Uh, and then it closes <clears throat> with an outlook to the future in terms of the opportunities for nonviolence with now <clears throat> what was considered an energized uh, constituencies, energized participants, an army of participants. So that was one of the strong things about this book. Second thing is the Birmingham campaign elevated uh, <clears throat> planning and preparation for its uh, uh, implementation with significant training from the citizenship education program and direct action nonviolence training. Uh, and included a pledge process, which by the time of the Selma campaign, which we'll uh, learn more about, it had become a manual for Freedom Army recruits. So there were lots of things about the Birmingham movement that showed an elevation of, of this uh, concept of using nonviolence to address the issues of race in America. The third thing is, Dr. King always did um, distinguish between revolt or in our words, protest, uh, from uh, the concept of uh, revolution. And the social movement, he said, only moves people is merely a revolt or a protest. A movement that changes both people and institutions is a revolution. This was way in advance of much wider discussion about these issues in the 67, 68, into the early 70s. Uh, the fourth thing is, Dr. King's admonition that the people move their leaders, not the leaders who moved the people, helps document a commitment he had, at least in principle, to the change process from paternalism uh, to the turnaround of respect among people of their own collective and dignified empowerment. So finally, I would say that the book artic articulates the arrival of a new era in nonviolence, which grew into what we now call King in Nonviolence, uh, including the six principles, the six steps, and the uh, uh, nonviolence organization and mobilization. So it a, it's, stands out among the five books as a real dramatic statement and articulation of where the movement was at at that period in history. Thanks, David. Are there any follow-ups? Questions or comments? I'm sorry, is it okay if I ask a question again? Because I asked one. Please. <laughs> well, I have to say that after we read that chapter uh, early on in the Ella Baker book, I decided to read the whole book. <laughs> so I'm almost done with the book. But one thing that surprises me, and I wanted to ask David, is you know the fourth thing that you mentioned about people move their leaders, not the other way around. 
Um, mm -hmm. Baker seems to have said that she thought that King was actually uh, practicing the other way around, um, having the leaders with the people. And, um, you know, I don't know, it makes me wonder what is it, what exactly is the truth on, on, um, on Birmingham? Because, you know, reading about her point of view of, of what SNCC did in Birmingham and then reading these other accounts, it's, it, and as somebody who didn't live through it, I, I don't know what to, what to believe. Well, it's not a, a, a yes and no situation. Uh, sometimes I think Martin Luther King spoke what he believed, but not what he practiced. And for example, in the book, he does give a lot of credit to people from SNCC and other people that were involved in a training process and a development process for Birmingham, including Diane Nash and other SNCC members. Um, he didn't mention Bernard Lafayette, but Bernard was there because he was already in Selma. And he would come down because he and Bevel were kind of running and Diane Nash were running partners. And so they helped each other out in every uh, campaign that they one of them was in. And um, so it was uh, uh, always a constant creative tension between the dynamics of, of all the organizations involved in that period of history. And it wasn't just about uh, the issue of that philosophy of leadership. But um, the important thing uh, for us was that he was able to recognize the need for that commitment to the leaders moving the people, or the people moving the leaders, rather than leaders moving the people. And that he could articulate that was so helpful because many other people could say that, like Ella Baker, and nobody would cover it, mm. or nobody would publish it until 40 years later. And so <clears throat> it was that period of history where things are not uh, neat and tidy. And there's always some contrast between uh, the principles one believes in and their own behavior. But overall, it's, a, it's, a, it's important because even though he was quite a charismatic personality, he really tried to respect other people's opinion. And he seldom talked in strategy meetings until near the very end. He would listen and ask a few questions now and then, and he believed very much in group leadership. And if he was at a conference someplace, uh, like he was in Florida one time for, I think it was the NAACP, uh, he had a lot of downtime, so he called up and SCLC ordered plane tickets for 25 liters of SNCC to come and sit around the pool and sit in the hotel room with him for the better part of two days, just to listen to their ideas on strategy. And he had, of course, he ended up hiring several of them uh, mm -hmm. over the next uh, year or two. So, so it's, 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 it's important to read all of these different perspectives because what Ella Baker was saying is, is part, is, has some truth to it, but also she helped him say it better. Yeah and helped other people articulate it. And so that was the tension that, that the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee leadership, many of whom eventually worked under Martin Luther King's uh, staff uh, structure, um, did not want to be the youth arm of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference because they had a different organizing philosophy. They had a rotating chairmanship. Uh, uh, and we go into this at another point in the, in the Beyond the Dream program, but. You could not, as a SNCC member, go in and organize a SNCC chapter. You had to work with the organizations there. In Selma, it was the Dallas County Voters League. In Alabama, it was a, uh, uh, a campaign for human rights with Shuttlesworth. It was an SCLC affiliate. But you couldn't organize an SCLC chapter as such. And so the impetus for that came from the philosophy of Snake and Ella Baker and important catalysts, including Jim Lawson and others, you know. I'm going to move our conversation to the next point. Um, thank you, David, and thank you, Joan May, for these framing comments. And thanks, Gail, and others for the question. Um, 
we're going to move into small groups now. Um, and in the small groups, what we're asking you to do is to share one or more quotes from any of the readings and comment why it stayed with you. Um, and those of us who are on the teaching and facilitation team will be there, but we're mainly just hanging out and listening to the conversation. So I think based on the group size, Radia, does two groups make sense or three today? It's definitely um, not four. Yeah, no, we definitely don't need that many. I think we can do uh, three rooms. Okay. Great. Go for it. All right. And maybe only 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Um, so we're headed into 10 to 12 minutes focused on the writings from Dorothy Cotton, Coretta Scott Chang, and Diane Nash. And our hope is that in that, um, we particularly like bring in stories from the text as we start and then move into things like questions that you have following the reading of these chapters and those kinds of things. But then we start by really bringing the texts and the stories that stood out to us into the room. Um, please, one way is to speak up if you have a connection to what someone just said. But if there's not an obvious connection, we might just go around the clock and choose someone to go next and hear from you. So um, who'd like to kick us off talking about the writings by um, Dorothy Cotton, Craig Scott King, and Diane Nash? You can just unmute yourself and jump in. Uh, I'll say um, about uh, Coretta Scott King when she wrote stuff about her children and, and you know, the separation of her, her and her husband. Uh, you know, I've experienced a little bit of this with uh, my spouse and um, not, we don't have children, but that's part of why we decided to not have children also. It was just that we didn't want to put our children through, um, you know, that kind of loss and that kind of like not having, you know, stable parents uh, because of activism. I, re I relate that to, oh shoot, what was that? Uh, yeah, the step three of personal commitment, like, you know, you have to decide on your commitment commitment levels and what's going to be safe for your personal situation. Thanks, Chris. Does anyone want to build on something from what Chris said? Yeah, I wanted to just build on, I mean, that's a really good point. And I just thought it was interesting with the Dorothy Cotton, where it seemed like, you know, you had Andrew Young, in essence, trying to protect her by saying, can we just use your car? And, mm -hmm. and the thought that, you know, in a sense, no one should really be making these decisions for you. You know, I, I come out of the fair housing world where, um, you know, there are still some realtors who think that they can discriminate against families with children, and ostensibly it's for good reason. They say, well, you know, we don't want to show family, uh, uh, you know, an apartment that has, a, I, I don't know, um, a terrace that, you know, where they could, the kid could fall out off the terrace or whatever it might be. And we always say, that's not your decision, you know, in a free 
society, you give people the options and they may, they decide. And, and that's kind of what I saw with Dorothy um, and Diane Nash too, that they, they assumed their, they were in their power. Yeah, that that was part of it because my spouse she takes the, um, about as many risks as I do, and so she's uh, she's out there. It's not just me; it's it's her too. One of the things that stood out to me in the cotton reading um, was a section about it was in the section about the march. And it was talking about, at the same time, it was talking about the citizenship education program and kind of how they build a base through being in the, in the program. And, and what really struck me was when she said 40 to 60 people per month attended the sessions, which were designed to help empower them and to remove the mental programming that put forth the notion that government was all powerful and alien to we the people. The people claim, came to claim their role as owners of government, understanding the job of government is to represent the people, that government works for the people. We had arrived at a new place, a new consciousness. And um, that, um, I'm always exhilarated reading about the citizenship education program, but that like succinct framing about what happened there. I'm not sure there's many places that that level of consciousness transformation happens today. So there's a lot of technique based training, like even in the world of nonviolence training, a lot of it is blockades and civil disobedience and so on and so forth. But like that level of reclaiming sovereignty from the government, and that the government is only to represent us, not, you know, like that's a deep level of work that really struck me. I really appreciated that too, Matt, and um, mostly because there's a lot of discussion about how the civil rights movement <laughs> change people's consciousness but how exactly that happened did you go on a march and suddenly feel different you know that isn't made so clear and i really he spells out there were that it was really in these leadership training sessions that came through the citizenship education program that that transformation began and i feel like that's a piece that we could learn something from um Well, I think underscoring both of those comments, that's why in the second phase of the, of the Beyond a Dream, we look at Miles Horton's experiences and Septima Clark's experiences and Ella Baker's experiences because they're all intertwined in terms of this educational philosophy and this commitment to leadership development mm -hmm. at a fundamental level. Someone else jump in here. We got about five more minutes left on these sections. I just wanted to of, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to follow up on some of that. I, I, I struggle with how the period and the time um, with what you, Matt, and Mary Lou were saying about this deep level of consciousness that, that comes out from Cotton's reading, it comes out, I think, in King's um, book as well. Like if there are barriers that are unique to our time period. Um, if there's a level of, even though there was a lot of oppression, if there was still some faith in government or we're in a period of, uh, where people have a declining sense of legitimacy in government, but also kind of in tandem with a sense of like apathy, where it's like a different type of programming to some extent. Um, I don't know, I guess I just wonder if other people see social, cultural, technological barriers or new things that we might have to contend with and trying to facilitate that kind of deep consciousness. Like if Dorothy Cotton's program, could we just take it and and put it down right now? And if we could have that same kind of transformative effect. So I think along with that, one of the things I was struck by was um, how 
community driven everything was. Well, I mean, in the sense that the reasons why so many women, not the reasons, some of the reasons why women were able to participate as much as they did was because they had other people ready to step in and do childcare. <laughs> like um, Coretta mentioned that specifically, that like we, I had a community around me when I was having, when I was raising my four, four children. And I wonder like how, I mean, I feel like there's been a shift away from community to individualism that makes it difficult to actually mobilize that kind of like community and engagement and support that allow people to make the decisions that allowed them to be active to the level that they were, um, both women and men. But, but, um, but that's been something that I've been sitting with kind of like, where's, Where's the call to community? Um, and kind of like, was that just part of like culture already? Was that already there? Um, or was it something that's like, um, that also had to be fostered in this like deeply intentional way, just in the same way that you had to foster like the ability to, to um, give up some of self in order to sacrifice? Well, I just want to say in that context, I think um, there was a sense of community that came out of the churches, for example. Um, mm -hmm. But I also feel like when there isn't a sense that we need to generate those kinds of communities. If we don't, if we're not living in the middle of one, we need to create one. Um, and that's, you know, I, I did some work with a nonviolence group in Philadelphia, which Matt has some connections to, which was very much uh, an 80s, which was very much a conscious effort to create a sense of community out of which people could then do their activism. Um, and for me, those relationships have lasted the last 30 years. <laughs> um, yeah, I... I I agree, Mary Lou, we have to create those communities. And one contemporary um, effort that I've uh, been excited about is the whole um, idea of participatory budgeting. I don't know if all of you are familiar with participatory budgeting. It's sort of taken off a little bit like wildfire. But the idea is that people come together in a neighborhood or a suburb or whatever it may be, and they decide where monies go. So, for example, in a Chicago ward, in Chicago wards, I think each of the 50 aldermen get a million dollars of discretionary money. So this one alderman decided he was going to use the participatory budgeting process to... Um, you know, to get the community to decide what the priorities are and where this money would go. And that seems to have um, kind of created that community. Um, you know, I think it's exciting because so much decision making now is so, uh, people are so disengaged that a lot of power goes to just a few people. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, that's one way to, to, to do it. Does anyone have any other just uh, quotes from any of the women's writings that you'd like to bring in before we bring this part of our conversation to a close? Okay, so we're headed to into a, a similar discussion building from um, what stayed with you from why we can't wait, um, particular stories or um, quotes if you have them, or just narrative parts that, uh, that have stayed with you since you're reading. What has stayed with me, and I think it was also mentioned, and I can't remember if it was 
Coretta or Cotton or Nash who mentioned it, but the, um, and this also shows up in why we can't wait, is the participation of the teenagers and the kids who um, cared about this so much that they ditched school and like suffered expulsion and um, willingly went to jail even if their parents weren't a fan of it. Like there was a power that came from the youth that like they, like this wasn't something that their parents were doing for them. This was something that they are also a part of and in ownership of um, and excited to be a part of. Um, so I don't really have a quote about that, but um, the power of that. And then the, the sympathy that got or from the rest of the country, like I think using kids in the movement was brilliant. <laughs> in Birmingham. There, uh, Jennifer, there's a, a film totally documenting that part of the Birmingham movement by the Southern Poverty Law Center. And I think it's for free use with uh, educational groups. Uh, but you can contact them about it. It's called a Children's March. And it, I just put a it link takes in the part, chat. What, Dorothy Cotton and... Yeah, I just put a link to it in the chat to a version that's online. Okay. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry, David. Yeah. It was very controversial, though, at the time among the leadership. Uh, and you had people like Dorothy Cotton and Jim Bevel on the one hand and then you had some of the older ministers not so certain about this and uh, of course it's obvious history shows who won out and the, the children didn't wait for a vote from the ministers <laughs> so uh, but but i think it's a 40-minute uh documentary of that and uh, it, it'd be really useful as a training film and there are many other resources out there too there I is. see. There's Mary Lou's holding up a, a cover of it right now. Yeah, and there's a, a DVD that comes with it. Mm -hmm. Chris, I wanted to find out you you are we're bringing up the pledge in the chat box, and I wanted to bring you in to talk about that. What what stayed with you from the pledge itself in the text, and what's your practice in direct action everywhere? See, uh, what was the first part you said? The the pledge. That no, I just like yeah. What's the, what stood with you from the pledge itself as you read it in light of your current practice? And um, you know, it's just you know to meditate daily. You know, all of the things, and it's on page sixty four, sixty three, sixty four, and why we can't wait. Um, you know, we we found that you know when we started. You know, we just let people in. Anybody who was interested just could just come in and start working. Uh, and then we said we run into a number of problems, and we found it difficult to hold people accountable uh, to to certain uh, principles and values. And so we said, well, these are our principles and values. Do you agree to them? We would have them sign this online form. And since then we found it much easier. There have been very few people we've had to kick out of our group, but really what it's been more of is reminding people of our principles and values. And if people are like, I'm not going to restrain myself. Uh, I'm going to like do whatever. It's like, that's cool. That's powerful activism that you should do. Maybe you would be more comfortable doing that activism with another group who has that same value that you do. And so, uh, you know, some of the things are just like empowerment of others and, uh, you know, and having respect for your fellow uh, activists and organizers and, um, you know, and calling people in instead of calling people out. You know, there's a variety of, of, uh, of things and, you know, maintaining nonviolence. And so... Um, that's been very helpful having people sign this agreement. Anyone who is an international organizer or in a working group uh, has to sign this agreement. Um, and, but we don't have it for our regular activists. And 
Um, but we do, before our protests, ask people to mostly to maintain nonviolence. And we ask people to feel if they feel like if they were verbally or physically assaulted, would they be able to not respond? And if they're not sure, we ask them to be in the middle of a large group or to not participate. So, um, so yeah, I found that to be, I thought they asked, the ask there was really powerful, I felt, in the, the 10, we call it 10 commandments, um, that pledge. It, those 10 commandments, mm -hmm. I thought that was a strong ask. Like, if you want to volunteer at all, you must do these things, pledge yourself to these things. And I said, wow, that's a strong ask. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if we could pull off a, as strong an ask as that, but I think it's something for us to think about. So, yeah. I don't know if I, I could talk forever, so I'm trying to. Yeah, thanks. Not. Does someone want to connect to anything that Chris was talking about or bring another quote in? I. To Chris, I would love to see your um, what you have people sign, if you'd like to share that at some point. Maybe you could email, put it on our list or something. One of the things that came up in our uh, smaller group earlier was, uh, and Gail raised this, you notice in the Why We Can't Wait how Harry Belafonte he showed up with $50,000 immediately available. And the question was, what other activities led to fundraising and how was that accomplished? And really, that was a very modest statement about Harry Belafonte because he raised so much money. He organized the entertainment industry for most of those 15 years to be supportive and financial contributors to the movement. Uh, because of his work, it kind of put the Ford Foundation and some other groups, Rockefeller's uh, Foundation, into a kind of a role where they felt compelled to contribute also to citizenship education program, to all kinds of uh, not so much civil disobedience direct action activities, but for sustaining these organizations like SNCC and, uh, and SCLC in particular, what we're talking about here. And so the, uh, the other thing is that as, as late as 66, uh, I remember Dr. King saying to the staff in Chicago that he made 2,000 major addresses a year during that 10-year period. And that now by 1966, uh, largely to help provide a financial base for his work, uh, he would make about $2,000 a speech, none of which he kept for himself. And so that was a tremendous amount of money at, during that period when the average income in the country was around $12,000 or something like that. And uh, uh, also during that period, the movements took place without the money because the money came afterwards, not up front so that every work project was an act of faith and a leap of faith because the money wasn't necessarily there beyond just subsistence. And, uh, but once the movement would begin to show success, then of course, larger sources of funding would come into play and come into being. But, but it was people like entertainers that were organized by Harry Belafonte, uh, these kinds of persons that help uh, create the sustaining funds for a lot of the work by, by SNCC and SCLC. Uh, you may recall also in uh, Coretta's reading mm -hmm. uh, that when her husband was in jail in Birmingham and she couldn't find out anything, um, he said, hire a nurse and a something, uh, a nanny, and go to Birmingham, 
I'll pay for it. So there are micro examples and macro examples. But for example, the, the field enterprise uh, was another foundation that's no longer in existence. But when changes took place at SNCC and John Lewis was finally pushed out, they hired him and he put five brothers and sisters through college because they paid him well and he'd never been paid for a very long time. So there were, there were foundations at that time that would, would fund social change related work and they weren't small foundations, they were large foundations. Uh, so then of course you had a church base that took up special collections and it raised amazing amounts of money that um, was largely undocumented. When Martin Luther King describes it, why we can't wait, that they went from 80 affiliate groups to 120 in the year of 1963. Well, those affiliate groups did three things. They raised money for SCLC campaigns, they sent people, and they provided local support from that part of the country in the media and so on uh, to uh, support that campaign in Birmingham. So. I don't know how much more you want to know about that, Gail, but, but there was, it was a many-pronged process, but it really was key on certain personalities stepping out, certain union people, uh, the UAW in particular, uh, Packing House Workers Union for certain, uh, and 1199, of course, in 67, 68, uh, became a, a, a big source to support um, the nonviolent movement from the hospital organization. Thanks for that, David. That was, that was what struck me in the book, especially when Dr. King himself said there are no words, you know, that uh, he couldn't overestimate Belafonte's uh, impact and the impact of that funding. And of course, it makes me think today, you know, in this parallel period of time, uh, over the last 50 years, we have had an exponential growth in nonprofit organizations. And then I don't know how many of you have read the book, The Revolution Will Not Be Funded by Insight. It's a, a, a women of color um, a collective. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a challenge to all of us who look for funding <laughs> from foundations that really just, they're just looking for, you know, tax dodges. Um, so, you know, I think that's a big difference between then and now. I mean, people now, like myself, I'm a professional organizer. I've been able to make a living off doing this and people didn't in the past. And, and uh, in a way there was something a lot more pure, maybe I'm a little nostalgic, but about what, the direct impact of, of uh, Belafonte and SNCC and SCLC and what they were doing versus institutionalization of, um, of our work, which almost depends on a continuation of these problems. I think it's important when with fundraising to to have donors who are willing to donate without strings attached or who are donating for the work that you're doing. Because uh, it's been a huge problem in grassroots and nonprofits uh, to, to seek money because then you change your messaging, you change your tactics, you change your targets because of you you need money and it's it depends on what your tr goal is and you know if your goal is something that's in general accepted in society then it might be easy for you to get money for that um, and to rely on that money but if you're going to be really pushing boundaries um, then it's important to not rely on money uh, too heavily, especially not on any particular heavy donors, like small contributions, five, twenty dollars, hundred dollars uh, per person. Contributions is 
you know, because that way no one individual is that important uh, in terms of money. But if you build up too much importance on requiring funds, that can really restrict your activism. It's something we're very uh, careful and worried about. So I'm going to see if there's any one more quote that anybody wants to bring in um, from why we can't wait. And then we're going to make a shift towards the last part of our call. Does anybody have something else? Just even if it's out of left field from what we've been talking about so far. Okay, well, feel free to bring it in if you want to. The next thing I'm going to do is ask everybody to go to the chat box. And um, to spend a couple minutes reflecting about applications of today's reading to your own work or your own context of organizing and social change leadership. So whatever stood with you that makes you think, we're here in Trotwood, Ohio, blah, 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 blah. Or here in the Nonviolence Institute I'm setting up in Chicago, blah, 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 blah um, et cetera. So it looks like Sonia's headed out. Adios, Sonia. And um, so let's all just take a minute to reflect about how these readings today or the conversation today um, might shed some light or bring some useful input for what you're working on right now. It'll take about one more minute to get a couple more people's responses in, and then we'll have some conversation um, about what people what you've been writing.
Well, I'll just go down the list here and invite every, and anybody who has put something in to um, comment briefly about applications of today's conversation and these meetings to your own work. And um, if there are folks who haven't written anything for any reason, if you want to comment, we'll bring you in. Um, Jen Scar, would you um, would you say something about your work in travel? With? Sure, I'm working with an organization called the Peace Place, which uses the Agape Sadia Graha training that's put out by Honor Peace to teach teenagers um, and younger about nonviolence principles. And I'm working with some youth right now, and their or youth I've worked with in the past haven't been very empowered by this. They don't think that there's a role for them in it. They're they're like, my parents should be doing this. Why do I care? Um, and so I'm inspired by that film and the the role of the teenagers in the Birmingham thing. So I'm hoping to show them that film and maybe talk about that with them and maybe help them gain some traction and creativity about what they can do um, in a big movement like this. Thanks, Jen. Um, my comments were about the challenge. Uh, like I was really, like the conversation about how the, tra the transformative experiences and consciousness raising that happened in the old days and where does that happen today? And like, I'm in a role where I have the opportunity to set up training experiences. Um, but sometimes like the folks that we're organizing with don't want to come together or, um, and so, and I struggle with that sometimes. Like I was doing organizing with counter recruitment um, organizers who are working in their own local high schools to resist military recruitment, and I was like, okay, let's like come together for a capacity building something. And they're all like, no, the work's too important. We don't want to spend our money or our time to come together and meet. And um, so, um, but my, one of my reflections is maybe it's just like the people that I'm actually working with because right now we have this group of folks that we're working with in Flint, Michigan, who like are ready to go through 15 days of training between now and the end of December because the water is about to get cut off in November. The water release, like bottled water that's being provided for free is about to get cut off and they want to do a deep, King in on violence preparation process between now and the end of the year for that. And they're ready to do anything. So maybe I just have been working with people who are more on the passive side of the spectrum of allies. So that's what I'm thinking about. Um, who's next? We've got Radia. Radia, speak up. Yes. Um, so I play similar to Jennifer. I think I was really um, encouraged by just the younger generation. So, you know, to be brief, like much of the work that I've done has been with um, college students at Howard University, and I'm hoping to bring a lot of that work here to you, Chicago. Um, but the issue has consistently been, and I think, you know, we've kind of made it this way because we're in the age of social media and that's kind of been the easiest way to interact. So outside of like, I guess this social media presence that's had and then like the campus community, that's really it. Like there, you know, there's been difficulties like doing like real on the ground work or getting to have that face to face interaction. So like, getting the link to this film I think will be really helpful because that's something we've been struggling with in terms of how to move it from just like, you know, posting on social media or blogging or doing things that are online, which is great, but like really having that on the ground touch and expanding that beyond just your campus community. So I'm hoping that, um, you know, watching that film will help to, make things a little clearer or give some ideas because I, I definitely try to, like when I'm, you know, hearing the conversations and the readings, trying to relate that to the now and how we can bring some of those things into the now. So I think it'll be really helpful. And I'm hoping that um, being here in Chicago now and in a new campus with new people, maybe there'll be some fresh energy and ideas to kind of make that happen.
Thanks for the uh, Gail. Talk to us. Thanks. Well, first of all, Radia, welcome to Chicago. <laughs> we should uh, get together at some point because we're me and Mary Lou and Sherry Bevel and Pam Smith are focused on youth in high schools, but um, but you know, really, we're all in this together. Um, so yeah, so that's what we're working on with this Addie Wyatt Center for Nonviolence training. And uh, as I wrote, you know, I'm I'm just struck by in also the in um, in Birmingham where it was really young people training young people. And when you're looking at this one model we focused on in Chicago at North Lawndale College Prep, where Kingian. Um, nonviolence trainer, uh, a chemistry teacher named Tiffany Childress. She got the training, went to the school, and implemented this whole program that reduced violence in the school by about ninety percent. And there's a there's a film about that, or a little fourteen minute clip. And what strikes me there is that you know again they're training they're training the kids. To train their peers, you know, and, and it's the peers that when the freshmen come in and they have their first day and, you know, it's the well-respected seniors that are telling the kids, you know, keep your nonsense out of the, out of the school. Um, so that's, uh, that's, you know, resonates with me. I, I mean, and, and in a way it's a little sad too, because it feels like, like, you know, those of us who are older, are we chopped liver? <laughs> but the reality is, I guess, you know, um, people listen to their peers, not necessarily a mom figure. <laughs> Thanks, Gail. Um, the next person to share is Chris. Do you want to bring something in? And there's also just some interesting stuff happening via chat, like other recommendations people are offering each other and stuff like that. So check that out. Chris, you want to speak about what you wrote? Are you muted? Thanks. Uh, animal liberation, getting humans to think about their relationship with animals and how that's typically a one of dominance and violence um, but I think in terms of this reading you know it makes me think more on how we organize how well are we you know empowering women um, actually and also just like I was talking to Kazu and he was saying when he runs a workshop uh, that he tries to have gender balance as well as ethnic diversity within that training and I was like, oh, wow, you know, all of the people here who are really interested in the nonviolence right now are more masculine. And so I was like, I really need to work to get women involved in the nonviolence portion. Uh, our protest working group until recently was all women, interestingly. But um, I don't know, just thinking about empowering, you know, women's voices and uh, other uh, disenfranchised groups. Uh, within our own group, um, you know, just, you know, for morality reasons, but also for effectiveness reasons. Like, uh, so just thinking, seeing the problems that, that other women had to deal with in the civil rights movement and thinking about, you know, women still dealing with a lot of these problems today, you know, in our own activist movements. And, yeah. Thanks. Um, I think there was a comment from Joan May. We'll go to you, and then we'll have a closing. Um, I had lots of other quotes, and I'll post them somewhere, but I was really struck by um, wanting to be a fly in the, room, in the wall in some of those meetings it, that the guest on, and it, when they gathered leaders together, like at the pen, and I'm wondering where those kinds of gatherings and how that kind of communication is happening now and I think some of it is 
happening on social media, but that doesn't help to make it intergenerational because mm -hmm. um, elders aren't necessarily tuned in to some of those discussions. And also, um, Harry Belafonte did pull, some of you know this, he pulled a group of youth leaders together about 10 years ago. And some of that led to the Gathering for Justice and the New York Justice League that is doing lots of great organizing both um and they I think they balance I don't know if you're familiar with them, Rodia, but they, they balance um their social media work with lots of on the ground work and then they have their own petitions and stuff. I can send you retweet you more information. Please, yes. Um, Carmen Perez is a young organizer who has been mentored by Harry Belafonte for like um, a decade, I think. And the gathering, um, her group along with Dream Defenders went to Highlander and they were trained by Kazu. So. You tweeted out a great uh, interview with Carmen Perez a couple of weeks ago. Would you? I did. I should post that, right? Yeah. Would you throw that like in a Facebook group or something like that if you could find it? Okay. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. Um, so we're into our last couple of minutes. Is there anyone that we haven't heard from recently who'd like to speak up? Yeah, it seems like Mary Lou and David. It's over to you for the last last words for today. Who's going first and who's going second? Go ahead, Mary Lou. Oh, you're muted. Well, I'm really excited to reconnect one more time to all of these old stories and particularly the women's voices and, um, and to really um, think with all of you about how we can use this for, for today. Um, we're very excited to be doing this work in Chicago, starting with high schools and working with also um, older, organ older people who could be good trainers for high school students. And I'm trying to think about how all of this fits. So it's just an inspiration to be with you all. And thank you. Uh -huh. David, final word? Well, this is the fourth generation that we're working with uh, for this type of training and leadership development. And it's just exciting to see what's happening. And it's like you throw a stone in the water, create ripples and waves. <laughs> so it's good to be a part of it. So um, those of us on the planning team often stick around to debrief the call a little bit. Anybody is welcome to join that conversation, but we'll end the call and end the recording and stuff like that now. And um, if you're not sticking around, adios. Have a great day. Take care.